for this project we're going to be laying out some lettering some some of the trim work that needs to go on here I don't know how much we're going to get done we need to put a 38 on the rudder to make it a little bit more scale like we need to come up with some graphics for the wing and some lettering before I go any further I want to thank both John Pothier and Elliot Scott for helping me lay some of this out and inspiring me and giving me some ideas and doing some mock-ups for me and whatever 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 they've both been extremely helpful in this now no matter what lettering or graphics you choose it's really one of the focal points of a model and for anybody interested obviously we still have the the gold leaf technique that we used on this this is one of the ones we don't have on video believe it or not I did this whole lettering job and never I had the camera sitting right by the bench and never bothered to videotape it that was going back to 88 though that's not only the graphics but the lettering the size the shape the color all have some some impact on the overall appearance of the plane so before you actually put you know the tape to the plane you want to have some mind's eye of what you'd like it to look like. Well, Winter made this copy of Tsunami and it basically left off the lettering, one of the focal points of the plane. And everybody that's in the shop says, when is he going to finish the plane? I call this block outline lettering and that's on many videos including the Brodak Cardinal. Excellent lettering, very easy to do. Adam Usko's got some really nice graphics. Somehow I don't think Karen would go for that rudder graphic. I don't know, maybe. Anyway, let's get down to shop. We need to get the artwork going, the pencil, to the paper, to the razor, to the who knows what. Ready to go to work. Now I'll start. I want to lay out what it will amount to be. I'll call them shields for lack of a better word. And I have some art paper, a pen, and several ideas. I want to try several different shapes. Notice that I'm always doing the bottom first. A couple of tips. Since the shields will probably be white over silver, you would never, never, never want to try to paint white on top of red. It'll bleed through for 400 coats. Even Brodak paint bleeds through. It's very difficult, extremely difficult to paint white over red. So what I'll do is when I get the shape that I want, the first thing I'll do is put a blocker coat of silver over that. I've been doodling back and forth with these pictures. This is similar to, I kind of traced that out of one of them, the uh, airplane books. But my old shit, now what I wanted to do originally is I wanted to have the horse's head in the shield somehow. But I haven't really decided what I want to do. Or I can do it in checkerboards and just replicate what I've already done. Basically on Strega, replicate the same thing. I like that too. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this down to the uh, local staples and shrink it down in about six different ways. So I'll have a lot of choices tomorrow. But in the meantime, I can lay out the shields. I think they need to be a little bit smaller. I'll take about an eighth of an inch off of this edge. I need to lay these out so they're symmetrical and of course even with a rib or even with an amount that they're off of the fuselage and at least I can get the silver base painted that'll block out the red so that I can then paint them white I went through and I, this is the original the Court Ladero space thing I, I couldn't figure a way of getting that even on my mind's eye I thought that might be one possibility I have all these things that shrink downs and shrink ups of the Miss Ashley lettering but what I really found useful and I'm glad I saved it is I had the original Strega that patterns I don't even have to make another pattern now so always good to save these it's already got the edge on it for when it comes time to ink it but now I know well maybe it'll keep the family resemblance and again I was I have all illusions of lightning bolts and pumpkins or whatever but I know this looks good in the air, so maybe what we'll do is we'll cha again change our mind. We could figure some way of getting a horse's head in that shield. We're gonna we're gonna give it a shot. 
Okay, I'm going to mask these off exactly the same as Strega. Just real nice, and I've learned this many times, is always make a plywood template of the shape that you like. I smoothed out the edge, of course, years ago, <laughs> five, six years ago. Put a little bit of wax on the edge even, put some tape on the inside, and now you have a pattern, basically the way we're going to do the lettering too, unless something changes. Now I need alignment points. And you'd be surprised, I've done many times is done that, put it too far forward, put it too far up against the body. Now, this is one of the nice things about a take apart plane, you can, you, the body isn't here in your way. If you put it too far out, mm, so it's kind of a critical thing, and I really want to get it exactly, I'm trying to find a spot that I'll be, like for instance, I can put that corner in that, on that rib cap, that seems to work. And I can use that as my reference, that that rib cap corner is my alignment point. So I want to check that reference, and from the fuselage, I'm at... Ooh, am I off? See how crooked that is? You could make this extremely crooked and not even realize it until it's too late. But that's the nice thing about having a pattern, rather than before you lay out any tape. Now I can just roll this this way. Still a little bit off. So even though it may look real close, it really isn't. And if, if these shields are cocked to one side to the other, it's not going to look right. Obviously, once you have one side on, and you have the pattern, you just put the pattern here, measure out, measure out whatever reference points. What I did to get this reference point, I just laid out two pieces of tape, one on top of the other, and that's my reference point. So it gives me a real, and before I, before obviously before I back mask it in tinfoil, I'll make sure all my reference points are where where I think they should be. Now we're almost there, ready to go outside. We're going to block this out with silver first, let that dry an hour or so. We'll obviously go around the whole edge with clear, with a thin coat of clear over the edge. But I'd never, never want to try to paint red, paint white over red, I'm just asking for trouble. Well, we're ready to go paint. Just got to finish edging this off with a coat of clear. And we really have been rushing because it does not look like a particularly nice day out there. That fine little edge of clear seals that up. We're ready to paint. It's just before you paint silver, see so I have a nut in the gun. It's real handy having all these guns hanging around now too. Never have to clean a gun, never have to change a paint. Anytime I need a gun, I've got a gun with that 
one gun for every color that's on this plane. But hear that sound? Even in a matter of two or three minutes, the, the pigment, there's so much pigment in the, the Randolph Brodak silver that it sinks to the bottom. Especially silver. What you're gonna find out, this is a really good trick too, is you never wanna take the plane out and go, you wanna spray for maybe 30 seconds, just let it spray because all of the pigment that's in this paint in the, the neck of the gun, a lot of times you paint, oh, there's no, well, Use my finger. Yep, there we go. Now let me go get the wing. It's real close. The wind is blowing real nice out here. Try to use my leg if I can. You definitely want a blocker coat anytime you're going over, going over red with white. I'm trying to put this on just the minimum. I don't want to build it up. go see that because I'm trying to spray dry anytime you try to spray dry that tip now it's gonna just cover like crazy there you go good little tip on the video okay now this one would be more typical of what you could expect if you're not spraying dry but that coat that'll keep all the colors from bleeding through especially red and white Blue bleeds into yellow terribly, too. Remember, these colors of paint are formulated especially for modeling to have a, more than the average amount of pigment. Because of our unique needs, the needs of this is we want to get on one millionth of a molecule of paint. Now once this dries, and I'll, I'm going to guess that's going to be about a half an hour, I have the white in the other gun, and I'll shoot the white. Now I, of course, let the silver dry. This looks like it's going to be too dry too. And I always like to give it one coat and then a light dusting at the end. But see, none of the red will bleed through this. As I say, it probably some will. None should bleed through. You should get pretty good, reasonable good coverage anyway. I did because the pressure is a little low here. Just jacked up the pressure to about 35 pounds. There we go, just a little bit better. But again, I, want it, I don't want to have to go back and give it a whole second coat. I want to give it a light coat and then just dust on the second coat. Very light. Whoa, look at this wind blowing. The Anaheim winds. Anyway, then obviously the next thing is to let this dry overnight. If I can, I want to fog in that canopy today. That's ready to go. Oh, look at this, the sun, as I say it, the sun comes out. Amazing. What I want to do is I want to fog in the, the cockpit. And this is a test sample of the new, not even out on the market yet, the Candy Apple Blue. So what I want to do is I want to see what it looks like over white. And it's a very bright blue. What it looks like over silver. I'm just trying to get some idea of... I'll probably just put it right over the silver. That's going to be a pretty color when it's done. 
This is one of the Brodak candy colors coming. Probably coming within a month or so. This is a new paint we've never used before. I put a little piece of tape on there. That's going to simulate that little cockpit break. The, the trick with getting a fog, the way I like to get it fogged, is I spray onto the plane, get it going, and then just work my way up onto the canopy. I want it to be as dark as possible down at the bottom and as light at the top, almost silver at the very top. But again, the easiest way to do this, it's kind of, kind of simple. Start on the plane. Don't turn the gun on and off, on and off. And you'd like to leave. Now, the temptation always is to make it darker than it has to be. That's really going to be a nice color. I want to also do a round the back. And around this band. Now the next step is I'm going to get the gun with the black in it and fog in all the edges in black. Next step is exactly the same thing with a little bit of black, just to put a shaded edge on it. In fact, I can cut this back just a little bit. I want to spray on the model first and just work up till I just see an edge. That's all. Just the slightest little shadow of an edge going up onto the blow. Go up over that line. Now I'm going to let this dry about 10-15 minutes and hit it with a coat of clear and then put it aside to dry. Now after the coat of clear you can get some idea of what that's going to dry up looking like even though the sun is already gone but I think that's going to be one of the nicer of the candy apple colors, the blue. Now it's always best just let it dry overnight of course and obviously before you pull off any tape or anything. This is going to dry overnight and tomorrow we'll get to work on this again. And this guy, the little bar over the canopy is going to be dry so we'll have plenty of work for tomorrow. good tip what will happen from time to time and we just had it happen is the tin foil will leave on a painted surface a surface that's already painted and got a, a decent finish like this or just some of these little spots that I guess we put on with our fingernails or who knows what but before I go any further of course a little dab of gorums and I mean just a just the tiniest little amount will clean that up and make it perfect now when I'm done, of course, I want to wipe this down with M600 to get off the gorms. But it takes all the tinfoil marks right off. But that canopy didn't come out too, too shabby. I kind of like it. Now on the real plane, the prototype has an outline of where the cockpit actually splits where the opening where the mating surface is. I want to try to lay this out with the 16th tape and then paint a, about a 16th inch stripe in it. Well, the 16th inch tape will be the, the thickness of it. First I put a, a 16th inch line along the back and that acts as a little shadow to make it look three-dimensional. Next thing I want to lay out that line and of course look at it from several different angles so I don't make it cocked one way or another, try to get it as straight as possible. Now, what's handy is to have the all of the pictures and videos and stuff we have because getting this angle back here is a critical thing. If it's not steep enough, it doesn't look right. If it's too steep, it, it's a critical thing. And I don't, what I don't have is an exact side view of the plane that I can pull that angle off of. 
Now this is the closest one I have, and of course you can't really tell because the cockpit is open. See now from this angle, now I want to make sure I get this dimension right, and I can measure that of course. Then pick up the point where the angle is going to start, and then get them to cross right in the center, and I think I'll have a real good shot at having that right. Now a good idea is to just hold your finger out from looking straight at the top. See that these two lines line up? These two, these two, and that the point is in the middle. And then we can back mask the whole thing. We can do this stripe with the brush. And of course just hold it by the photo until you're happy with it. Now we want to put tape, I'll cut off all the extra tape and then put tape around the whole perimeter is so just the middle is black and then I can paint it in with a brush. Get all these extra tails off, the extra pieces because I'm going to mask around the outside of this. And where there'll be a problem is right in because the tape's not going to want to go in there. I'm going to have to be very careful to get that down. And once I know it's down and maybe even slit it and then put an extra piece right on top. So all the extra tails are gone, you can really double check and see if that's exactly the angles that you want to have. Because remember on a real on a real plane this whole piece slides up and I still haven't given up on some future having this piece slide up like the sea fire. I think that would really look cool. Now with the whole thing back masked, next thing is to carefully pull out the 16th tape and seal this with a coat of clear, let it dry. Maybe while it's drying I can mask out the other the other fuselage here. I'd like to get both of these done today. And once this is pulled out, then I can really get a look at exactly if I have this as accurate as I possibly can make it. And that's where it's going to be a problem, right in there. I've already slit the tape in there. And once this dries, usually one or at best two coats of black will cover this. And we'll let it dry overnight. And we'll have one more step of the cockpit detailing done. Now while our clear is drying, I can mask off the, the wooden fuselage that has the cockpit. Now by having one done, I can just transpose the measurements or the dimensions right off the other one. Again, this is where having a touch-up kit is so handy. There's all little stuff you can pick up off the video, and I'm never sure what it is, but I know when I watch other people work, especially modelers, I always see little things they do that make my life easier. Anyway, we're going to let this dry. Got a couple other little things to work on while this is drying. In fact, we got to let this dry overnight. What am I talking about? Now, sometimes you need a second coat. This looks like maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know until it dries. But since the canopy is a focal point of the plane, we like, we like not to cheat this on getting all the little details we can in. Now I guess the next step here, <laughs> you know I've been looking at this from a lot of angles trying to see if I like it or don't like it. I guess the next thing is we gotta put this aside to dry let it dry overnight, pull off the tape, and then see if we really do like it. 
There's so many other things to work on right now that uh, it doesn't even matter. We're not going to lose any time here at all. And at how I, well, I think I did this with ink. I can't really tell. Yeah, that's done with ink. But it's the same type of cockpit. Now, before I lay out what I hope is going to be the graphics, a couple of the things, I always try to look through my old Mustang books, all my books. The two things I like, and I've boiled it down to two choices, I'm either going to just have checkerboards in there, probably black and white because they are the easiest to do, or I looked at this little, this little Mustang emblem, which I like too, and I haven't had that. I, I made that paper, I, don't know, I guess paper doll is the right word, from... From one of these, in fact, it's it's a pretty good copy of this, which is large enough that what I did is I just took a tracing of it. This is obviously on the rudder of one of the planes, but when you go through the book, and again, the book is so hand. Of course, there's all kind of nose art, different things that may of be of some value. But I was looking for what I'm really trying to find is a good, well. Those shields, I'd like them to be something other than checkerboard. Obviously, maybe I, maybe that's not true. Maybe I'm not going to be able to have that choice. But I thought I remembered in this book seeing some of the other Mustangs that had... Oh, here we go. So some of these, and again, this is just the idea. At this point in time, what you really need is ideas, or you need somebody that you can copy, just make an outright copy of. Now, obviously, if we had a little more art talent, we could even consider things like that. But we're going to try to limit... Oh, here's another one. Look, on the next page. I didn't even see. I like the idea of a black, the silhouette. Now, what I wanted to try to do is combine the black silhouette into the shield, maybe with some checkerboarding, maybe not. Some combination of things. This Mustang has, has it in yellow. Now, I'm not sure, but I think if I remember right, this is the the trademark or the insignia of the Cavalier company that converts the Mustangs. It may or may not be, I'm not sure. Now here's another deal. Well, that's a lot more elaborate than the original one. But anyway, the, the point that I'm trying to make is you need to go through and you need to have an idea. You have to, you need to, at least I do anyway, I need to have something in my mind's eye that I can see. Some people really, they even do the spinner. I need to start with something in my mind's eye and then kind of fudge it and work with it and move it around. Well, that's something kind of cool. Look, I've got a little witch there. Anyway, I want to get out my box with all the old graphics in and see what I can come up with. I know there's other ways to do this, but I basically just took that magazine page down to Staples and reproduced it in about nine different scales. I think I did eight of them. So that I have, it's actually a copy of the magazine page. And of course you can do this with a computer, but it's it's out of the realm of my skill level right at this minute. But each time I can make it bigger and bigger and bigger, you get the picture. It's like almost like a cartoon. Now, by looking at these various shapes, I can somehow lay these up on the model. In fact, I'll do that next and get an idea of just how big or if I want to use them at all. I mean, I don't have to use, I can I can improvise here. Now, another thing that I've done in the past, and it's worked out well, I've taken graphics like this and customized them and just said, yeah, I like the horse's mane bigger. I want flames coming out of his mouth or make his tail look like a dragon's tail. But it's easy if you have something like this to start with, something that you know kind of appeals to you. Now, a couple of things that I always consider here, I've already got the white paint on here. Now, what's nice about this, I don't have to back mask again if I decide I'm going to make a mask in paint. I have the choice of I could ink this in. I have the choice of going to some combination of wool checkerboard, some checkerboard. But now by having a slew of these, and I have them in, I'm, going to, I'm just going to cut these out and get some idea of, now I, I've even thought of, let me show you this because maybe you'll have a better idea if, well. I even thought of taking like the real large ones and just doing the head in there. Well, again, I've got plenty. This whole thing cost me less than a dollar. 
So I'm going to just sit here and uh, pretend I was a real artist for a while. Now I'm cutting, obviously, on a cutting pad here with a brand new blade, of course. See, I, I always get into this mode where I want to pretend I'm an artist. And I look at something and I say, oh, yeah, I can do that, I can. And halfway through the thing, I oh, that was a lot more work than I thought it would be. But we can try this without ever, you know, without even spending not even one hour of... That's a little tight there. And get some idea if this is going in the direction I want it to go in. Now obviously if you're a professional artist, this is no big deal. It's only a big deal when you're windy. Now, one choice I would have here is to just tack this on and go around it with an ink pen, but mm, I think I'd kind of like to paint it better. What I think I'm going to strive for here is to make a stencil. In fact, it looks like I could even make this one thing bigger, one size bigger. Nah, I'll leave it this way. I need to make four of these, so what I need to do is lay out the shield and then make four four negative templates so that this piece is missing. In other words, well, I need three more is what I need. And that'll be my back mask. And I'm going to make these with ordinary, this is just ordinary copier paper, nothing special. And that's what's nice about laying this stuff out. Now see, I haven't decided either if I want them to go that way, or if I wanted them to be red, or some, but I think black and white just or if I wanted them on kind of an angle. Now, I wanted to include some checkerboards, but I'm not sure how I can do this. That's why they pay artists big money. <laughs> and they pay me nothing. Okay. See, because I have the plywood template, and I have that drawer all full of other little gizmos and that little griffin that we made up, the bird's head, the cardinal's head. I want to try to do four at once, but I don't have any high hopes. And if I have to, I'll just sit here and do four of them individually. See, the one thing about modeling that I mean that I like anyway is when you come upon a problem. Now, if we were in the real world, let's say this was a machine shop or something, or the real world of just the real world, everything would get to be a factor. But in the world of modeling, nothing is a factor. If this is going to take ten extra hours or one extra day, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I've got all this done. Now what I was anticipating doing, and maybe I'll be able to do this, and maybe I won't. Because the one on one side will basically just be a mirror image of the other side. And I wanted them to be as, as similar as possible. And notice I'm going over a cutting pad. Not sure. I'm going to try some brand new blades and see if I can do four of these at once. But again, if I can't, hey, that's what's nice about modeling. That's what makes it different than, you know, the workaday world, where everything is a problem. Okay, now I have that. Now I can kind of lay this out, get a feel for exactly where I want to have this. Do I want it sideways, upside down? I want to try to line it up with the center if possible. A little bit further down. Even something like this is relatively critical. And what I can do is, since I don't, I want, I don't want to destroy this little piece. I can trace, and this will be real easy. I can just trace this out with a fine point pen. And once I have it all traced out, I'll see if I can snake it in. Now, see, at this point, if I wanted to change this, if I wanted to make his ears a little bigger or his tail a little, now that it's in the shield area that it's going to be in, I can, I can really get an accurate look at it and see how that's all going to look. A 
looks like I'm going to be able to cut for it once. And I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking. So you could think out loud here. We've been friends a long time. That I tried this ahead of time, and then if it didn't work, I just not put it on a video? No. Nah. Because that doesn't tell you anything about the world of modeling that you can relate to. You know inevitably some of the things you do are not going to work. So if you're not showing the mistakes or the errors or the, the dilemmas, the dilemmas is a better word, I don't know that it's an accurate representation. And I think you learn more from the things that don't work, of which there's plenty in my case. But I don't think we could have ever gotten through this carbon fiber fuselage if, if we were not, ex not prepared to take some hits. And we've taken plenty of hits, that's for sure. Anyway, it looks like these, a, a brand new blade, obviously. If I have to change the blade four times, it's still easier. Not easier. To, I want to be able to cut out four at a time, just in case I want to do this. I decided at the last minute, I don't know, I want to put a pig here or an ostrich or something. Now, obviously, I didn't cut through here in some spots. The nice thing about this is you can make a graphic up, as long as you have a pattern or some friend that's an artist or a computer guy. You can make these patterns up for really pennies a piece. Or some of these masks that they, these vinyl masks, you know, get to be expensive. I think this way is certainly doable. Oh, I missed the spot. Now, in theory, I should have four that are very similar here. Can't say exactly the same, but real close. And, as a, as a free bonus, I have four little paper horses that, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I can do with these. Anyway, we'll say, but I'll save all of these. Just for instance, if I ever have to repair this, or somebody, if I had, believe me, if I had an accident at the field, a, a golf ball would go right through the horse, every time. The thing that this buys me is two of these have to go on a wing, and I don't know if I'm going to have them facing outward. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Do I want them facing outward? Or inward? You figure it. Do is I start an envelope with all the graphics that are going to be in this, all of the extra horses and the patterns and everything. And by the time I'm done with the lettering and the 38s and everything, I'll have all of this so that Elliot can use these when he does the final copy of the plans. And he, he, maybe he can include all the graphics on a plan. So basically, you can go through and just cut that out. This is just common, ordinary. You buy it in Staples, rubber cement. Nothing special here. What I want to do before I put it down is just make sure all the edges are down. This is what's nice about having it all back, man. And just lay on plenty. Don't try to make it pretty or cute. It's going to dry in a matter of a minute, maybe less. So you want to get it on relatively wet. You don't want any areas. There we go. I see it's starting to kick off now. Let me get one of those. I decided, big decision, I was going to have them face outward. Now, it's real important that I get this lined up because I only get to do this once. Like contact cement almost. Drop that down onto the paper. Now, while it's drying, I can do the other one while this is drying. This will take four or five minutes. Not long to dry, though. I just press all the little details down. Again, a nice pot. It's so cheap. This, this $1.80 for the cement, you probably could do. We've used that same bottle of cement, I think, since 1990 for doing this stuff. Now you got to be real careful about these little edges. Because the next step, once this is dry, we're going to remove all the cement from here. We're going to start at the middle and work to the corners. So you want this to be good and dry when you do that. You don't want it to be tacky. And just let that sit there. And while that's sitting there, I'll lay out the other side. 
that I want to have mask and tape around the edges here. Two purposes, it'll keep the, the pattern from shifting. Because we're going to have to leave this on overnight once we get the extra cement up. It needs to dry so you can almost, I'm, I'm guessing 5-10 minutes. It's 62 degrees in here now. So if you took it outside or if you were in a warm area, this is going to dry real quick. This is a very easy technique to master and you can use it for your lettering, you can, you can use it for anything. And if you have a friend in a computer business, he can computer generate these things and upload them and download them. And which in my case, I have two really excellent computer people, Elliot and John, both really know their stuff. So I'm the only dumb one in the whole crowd, in fact. Okay, still not ready yet. It's going to take another minute or so. That, that has to be able that when you pull it, it balls up. No, not yet. This is, this is not really the trick, but you want to start in the middle and work into the corners. You see how this is turning to chewing gum? You want to work and you want to be real careful not to pull up all these little areas. Now what I always do is when I make the mix of paint that's going to go into a stencil like this, I make sure I don't forget to put the fish eye killer in because some of the grease from my fingers will wind up in here. But you can really get a nice fine edge. You need to remove and see here's this is it looks it's pretty disgusting, like a little chewing gum or whatever. Once you get that out of the whole stencil, and obviously I'll get all four of the sides ready. And we'll be ready to take it outside and spray it. That chewing just go from the middle to the outside, get rid of it. You don't want to leave any of that rubber cement in there. And you want to do this and get it painted. You don't want to do this and then go for coffee. You want to do this and get it painted. And then let it sit overnight, of course. Do before doing any of these graphics is I want to get the gun totally adjusted. I want to get the pressure down as low as possible since we're never going to put tape on top of this. We don't really need to blow on a, an inch of paint. I, obviously what I want to do is I want to do the bottom first. A little difficult holding this. Let's see, get the sun on it. So what I'm trying to do is not blow on a big heavy coat so that I don't have a ratty edge. I'm using it almost like you would use an airbrush. This technique, I ought to give Jimmy Casal some credit. The first time I ever saw this, Jimmy showed me how he did it. I don't know if he invented it. But it certainly is a very nice way to do this kind of graphic. And the truth is, if you're going to do a project with, with this complexity, uh, another day or two in the project doesn't mean anything. Although you still could use this for, even if, you know, the beginner plane, it wouldn't matter. The idea is don't put on any more paint than you really have to. Don't try to get it. Oh, there goes the wind. The Anaheim winds are kicking up here. Now, I think for our purposes, that's just about going to do it. I don't know if we're going to get this. Yeah, there we are. We're going to get the reflection on the tape. 
turned out to be, believe me, this is Anaheim, USA. Paint will dry up in five minutes. Now, the real Miss Ashley had a short but very, very colorful life. We don't have the life story of Gary Lovitz yet, but I'm sure some of it will be documented on it. A great video. One of the things I, I needed to do, I needed to lay out this number 38, obviously, on the rudder. It's a, it's a complex looking type of lettering. And in, it looks like to me, and I don't know for sure, like at any given time in the life of a plane, it had about five different paint jobs that I can identify from pictures, but the earliest one showed a red 38 on the rudder. Some of the pictures, the 38 shows up as black. And in some of the pictures, it almost looks like a navy blue color. So it's really difficult to tell because there's so many legitimate paint jobs. Same with the lettering. If you notice some of the pictures, it shows death desothane on one side. And in some pictures, the same airplane. And it says Cortlitz Aerospace. So what it, what it does, it means we can have a pretty free hand as far as laying out the lettering on the fuselage and rudder. This is what I like about not having to be totally scale. For instance, we're not going to be able to replicate this lettering here. This being because it's this small, it'd be really difficult to get it nice. And I'm going to use that the same type of thing out on the wing. But I have choices as far as lettering the sides of the plane and all these the little uh, racing stickers and everything. I've a lot of choices. When you model a Spitfire, there's just endless choices of rudder shapes, paintwork, invasion stripes, lettering, cockpits, bubble canopies, griffins, merlins. That's what makes the model unique. Now, this is one area of construction where you really save a lot of time, as opposed to having a plane where the elevators would be here and things would be in the way. This will allow us a very convenient way of laying this out. This is a fax of a computer generation off the picture. It's not very clear, but it's certainly clear enough to lay this out in full scale. And I need to see, obviously, this is the, the thing I need to figure out, is do I need to downsize this, upsize it? I'm looking at the picture. This goes pretty low, in fact. Now, one thing that's real neat about this, real nice, is I only really need one of these letters. No, I really guess I need two. I was going to say I could make the eight into a three real easily. No, I guess I do need both of them. All right, so the next step is going to be the same as before. I want to trim this all out. I want to cut this out. It's going to be the same as the other graphics, so I'm just going to skip through this until we're ready to paste this onto the rudder. Now what makes this graphic difficult is that when it goes to the other side of the rudder, of course, it has to be reversed. So I'm going to use the other set of letters to basically make an alternative set because the sweep will go in the, uh, in the opposite direction. It also has these fade out lines that I guess the only way realistically here I can do this is with 16th masking tape. I put this on with rubber cement. And I need to go look at the picture to see if these, these look pretty parallel. And just 16th gaps. I guess that's going to be the only way to... Uh, and I'm only going to be able to do one side at a time. With all those beautiful little lines of tape that I want to run at, I can only do one side at a time. I'll put some tin foil on this. Spray that real dry. And hope that I don't get a lot of overspray in between the lines. Now obviously we got to wait for this to dry. Now while it's drying, I'll make the reverse pattern of these numbers because the slant, these, these lean back, and they need to slant in the opposite direction. I'm just going to mirror image them. It's just to show you how intelligent I am, and I, and I really take full credit for this. this. This lettering lays back a few degrees. So of course on the other side of the rudder, this side is, this is already laid out one way. And it reverses. So you would think you could just do that and cut this here. Well, you know, you can't. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. 
Now, I had some of these, and what I thought it would be so easy to do, it isn't. It doesn't, it doesn't interpolate that way, because I want it to lean this way. So what I did, I just, I just basically <laughs> sketched up another 38. Because on this side of the plane, the whole letters, you would think you can flip them over, but the reality is you can't. So it'll give some extra dry time to that while I, what I've been doing is taking the, my little French curve and going around in all the areas and trying to, trying to get it. But another seemingly small insignificant detail that you think wouldn't be a big deal, and yet it eats up two or three hours of your time. Finally, finally got this laid out. Well, I'll tell you, this is, this is definitely labor intensive. Labor intensive. Now, if you don't think that took time to, f <laughs> wow, I'm looking at a lot of hours condensed down into condensed orange juice here. Okay, tomorrow we'll pull the tape, see how it looks, see if we've captured that look that we're really looking for. Today's mail. <laughs> got this this is only I think three days three three days after VSC I have a video I don't know what the quality is see this is the whole problem this is from a uh, banana Milano remember on the last video he uh, he was playing a guitar and we've played his guitar actually my my daughter likes your music I'm not a musician I don't know about anything about music all I know about is Brodak dope and how to make planes shiny but anyway sent us a VSC video so Soon as I'm done copying today's tapes, obviously, and if there's anything really funny on here, like Paul Winter's driving school or something, we'll be sure to include some of it in. Anyway, now he, I don't know why they call him Banana, but that's a good name. I got something really cool here. It's just in the nick of time. Now, had this package come in, and it isn't because I didn't order it in time, this gentleman called me up, asked me if I'd like to test his spray gun equipment, and I had no idea that I was going to get a box. <laughs> there's, there's enough spray equipment here. We can open a body shop. Anyway, this is artist quality. It's not the kind of stuff like I use and sell, by the way, the, the, the um, let's call it hobby stuff. This is real artist quality stuff. Now, I what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through here. I guess it's a little late for putting a trim on this. In fact, a week, a week earlier, and we would have been able to put all the trim on with this. So the first thing I need to do, obviously, is dig in here, read how to use it. I hope I'm saying the guy's name right, William Namura. But anyway, he was gracious enough to send me all this stuff. Now, apparently, he's on the World Speed Team, so we won't get to see him at the Nats, but I really would. He's from Portland, Oregon. And they have all these cool accessories. Now, before I use it, I'm not used to using high-tech equipment. I'm not used to using even dirty equipment. I guess part of this is I'm a little overwhelmed by how much, how much nice stuff. Now, I know George has used this. Oh, there's all kinds of... I, I can't even open this up right now. But what I'm going to have to do is on another video, or maybe I'll do it later on in this video, because I don't have any trim to paint. That's the problem. I'm, actually, one day. All this would have been is one day. But if I do have something left, oh yeah, I have the lettering to do. Okay. You can tell I rehearsed this, right? And there's cups. Now, this is a gravity feed gun. Let's see what this looks like. The reason I'm excited about this is I don't get to road test a lot of this real nice stuff. Now this, I can tell just by how heavy this is. This is not your hobby quality equipment. 
Oh, yeah. It's nice to have nice stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I've spent a whole lifetime with garbage and having nice stuff. I don't even know if I'm used to this yet. But anyway, we are definitely going to do a thorough test of this sometime later on. I have to set it up. I have to do my own little uh, preparation. But what I do want to do today, because now here's, this is just a real, the best tip I can ever give you. That tape has been sitting on there 24 hours. And the rubber cement really isn't like tape. It's not a problem getting rubber cement off. But you really don't want to leave the tape on. I don't like to leave anything on any longer than possible. 24 hours. So what I'm going to do before I get a time to do this, maybe we'll get it later today, I don't know, or best tomorrow. I want to get the equipment out, take all the, all the tin foil off, all the tape, and then I guess one of the next steps is I have to start laying out that lettering. That's... I've been trying, I've been hoping like it would lay out itself, but it ain't going to happen. I'm going to have to do it. Anyway, from, from William, I'll send William out some videos so he can get a look at what we do in the shop here. And I'm hoping we're going to uh, eventually be able to put these up on our website, the ones that are, I, I'm sure these are much higher quality than what we use. Just by looking at them, I can tell. And let me, let me get this on the, here. In case anybody's interested in contacting for either a catalog, it's William Nomura, P.O. 14397, Portland, Oregon, 97293. The phone number, 503-253-7308, fax 503-253-0721. And he has a website, and we will be linking up to his website probably by the end of this week. And again, Bill, thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy the videos that I've sent you. As I said before, I don't really like to... Uh, I'm, I'm just superstitious, I guess. Once I look around and see that I've covered and I don't have any bald spots, because obviously if you had a bald spot here, you wouldn't want to have to go remask re the whole thing. Now the nice thing about doing these in black is, see I can see that's up just a little bit. Nice thing about doing these in black is if there's a bad spot I can touch it up with ink or if I need to straighten something out. So I'm just going to very carefully now, very carefully pull off all this masking. And whenever you peel back from rubber cement you want to go real slowly and carefully. You don't want to just tear it right up or you'll, you'll definitely make some damage that you don't need. And what I find to be helpful is if I can just roll it back very carefully like so. Now I know I'm going to have to pull that tape off separately. And this just gets a little time consuming, but think of the alternative. When I've used those sticky back masks, wow, sometimes it takes up the whole substrate. And this comes off the rubber cement, just like the rest of the stuff, when you get it all off. I'll just take it off nice and slow. All this will get a look at. The rubber cement usually stays right up there. And it'll come right off. You just roll it up like chewing gum. Now on little things like the tape, it's always better to pull up and pull onto the pattern. Looking forward to testing that spray equipment. That's that should really upgrade our spraying ability here. There's going to be a couple little spots like this little uh, overspray because we have a hinge line. You can see we oversprayed right in there. We can touch all that up. That's no problem. But the final thing is to really go by real carefully and get off all the rubber cement. And if there's any little spot in the black where it peeled up, I think on the other side. Oh, here. I had a spot on the other side where the paint just lifted up. Usually when you're using a dry spray, what'll happen is you don't get a good bond. So around here, it just you see this whole edge. I just didn't have it sealed real well. But we can touch that up with an ink pen. It's no problem at all. Now these little edges up here, this is where there's rubber cement. I don't know if you can see this. You just rub it with your finger until that all goes away and then I'll clean the whole thing up with M600 and I'd say that's uh, 
a pretty pretty decent rendition of the 38 and a pretty good pretty good graphic job in the hinge line you know obviously we couldn't tape that off so we're gonna have to kind of get in there with a fine hair brush if we want that to be perfect this is some M600 and sometimes if the overspray is very gentle you can, it'll, the M600 will just take it right off in this case some of it's coming off and some isn't but I want to clean carefully clean all that rubber cement off the rubber cement technique I'm sure is a, no big secret and again, Jimmy Casal was the first one that showed me how to do it. I'm just getting it. When you're at this point, you've got to take a little patience and clean it all off. Again, what I always have is the old the thing of M600 around. Number two, what that does, it keeps you from getting fingerprints on all this because it dries your fingers out and turns your fingers into chopped liver. See in here, in these fine areas, the M600's taken out a lot of the, the little unevenness. And, and like I said, now I'll get out an ink pen, an ordinary drafting pen that we're going to use to do ink work later in the plane. And any little spot like right here I'll need to touch up, well, I'll sit down with a little, uh, with my real close glasses and go over this up here I think we could we could just dress that off but before you do any of that cleaning it is always a real important step you don't want to leave out now I do have that one spot let's see where it is over here and this is my own fault I wasn't pulling it up properly but you could back mask that and airbrush it but when you find what you find out is with the ink when you're all done you don't even see it if it was a color other than black obviously then we'd have to go back and I see I like to get most of this this is what I wanted to show us I like to get most of this off with dry fingers not and don't wet it with M600 it just dilutes it and makes it a little messier than it has to be to work but it's a little technique you can pick up see how that comes off it just oozes right off and you just keep cleaning it sometimes you'll get a little piece like this I take a little gorms on a q-tip it'll get 99 percent of it off and then a little ink line will just make it perfect now I look around especially on the hinge line here oh there's another spot up here You can do some pretty exotic, cool stuff with this with this little technique. But you usually have a little bit to touch up. Or usually what Jimmy used to do is he used to put ink lines around everything. Well, you can do that too. No law against that. And we're going to have to get our little touch up down into these areas because I want to have the trim going through the ink lines accurate too. Just one more little detail. And the truth is, a lot of people won't even notice this. They won't see it or whatever. But I see it. See, down here, there's going to be a point I'm going to need to put on. That didn't come out cr as crisp as I'd like. Little spot right in there. Little spot here. Rather than touch it up with white, it's easier to just to get the little extra overspray off. Certainly have the world's record for never cleaning my ink pens. In fact, every year this time of year, I say, "Oh, did I did I really forget to clean them?" So you can see what's going to happen here. I'm going to have to take them over to the sink. This is get this gets to be a pain. All I want to do is touch up. So even if one of these works for now, well, we'll get into the cleaning when we actually are going to ink the pen. But I always. And if you have a little bit more discipline than I am, you'll clean these are the white ones. See, I marked the ones with black ink. This one leaks. You would think a man with my income, you know, I'm up in the uh, the, the twenty thousand dollar a year bracket. I could get a four to set of pins. This one's dry as a bone. That's nothing's coming out of there. 
Well, I'm going to have to take one over to the sink and clean it so I have one pen. Oh, it's funny, i got to tell you the truth. Lou Dutka, who used to be a professional draftsman, this is not what I want. See, there's, there's all different kinds of ink. You want to get the one that says, there it is, for acetate. This is the one that seems to work the best. What I can say is don't wear your good clothes when you're going to do any inking. I usually wind up inking the floor, my shoes, my nose. Get a little bit less than full. Yeah, it's important not to try to ink with anything except the ink for acetate. Oh man, look at this, what a pain. I used to be able to send these pens to Bob Martens and he'd send them back clean. And boy, he had some kind of ultrasonic cleaner, but I don't. I have the sink. Okay, but the idea is, if don't be a windy and leave them sit all winter with junk in them. I mean, that's still not working. That's going to take take a little hot water. I'm going to have, there we go. See, I want a relatively fine point because I want to touch up all those little areas. Here we go. Look at it. Who said he doesn't know anything about ink in a plane? Okay. People think you need $1,000 worth of professional drafting equipment. Nah. Make sure right where I'm going to ink, I have a pad, because these pens stop writing in the middle of everything. There we go. I want to make sure I have... It's a relatively fine point pen, and they seem to stop writing quicker than the others, but I want this all ready. In anything I'm going to ink, I want to make sure I have a ruler with a little bit of tape on the opposite side. The idea is you want to have a... Oh, just a little bit back, maybe three layers of eighth inch tape. Reason for that is you don't want the ink running underneath. Now, I've used this. This is my rivet marks and everything. By the way, if it, we're not going to do extensive inking on this flame, but if you really want to see a good inking video, the Seafire one or the I-Beam Spitfire, they really are detailed. They're, they're full coverage. What I try to do is start with just getting the outline in, especially if you're using a fine pen. Get the outline in. Keep that pad handy, that pad you need all the time. And I don't want to press any harder than I have to here, but I just want to basically fill in this area. Now the nice thing about ink instead of paint, it won't be any higher than the paint around it, and it'll bury in the clear in one coat. And once we get all this little detailing done, we'll put a coat of clear, just a very, very light coat of clear, just to seal it up. You can see that kind of fills right in. Now, if you have a bigger tip pen, it'll fill in quicker, of course, but then you can't get the details with these pens. Believe me, the pens can be frustrating if you're not a pro draftsman. And it was just such a big help having Bob Martens give me all these tips years ago, but I still find it frustrating. Now, you can see that that's basically covered in that area. Now along here, I don't have other areas, but along here, all of the little spots on a line where it didn't come clean, I can clean them up with the pen. And if, I, if they're straight lines, I can use a ruler. Curved lines, I can just pretty much do by eye. And this will be a little time consuming. I may spend a half an hour or so just detailing this out. Now where this is really going to be handy is in by the hinge line where there's some spots like that. There's that rudder. There's some spots on the rudder here where I need to get the lines to go completely across. Uh, let's see, this one here for instance. As usual, the pen stops writing. It's, it's areas like this almost be impossible to do with paint, but you could clean them all up. I want all these lines to go wherever they would, in, would inevitably wind up. See where those little bars in the hinge lines where they're not, just not perfect? Well, that's where having a nice touch-up kit comes in handy. Comes in handy if you have a friend that's a professional artist, too. 
That's what we need. Somebody moved to Jersey that really is an artist. Anyway, so all these little details that I feel in the final model, I mean, I'm hoping, the hope here is that I'm going to be looking at this for the rest of my life. So I really don't want to have a, that I skimped an hour here or an hour there or whatever. There's some kind of poem, and the closing line of the poem is, The gods see everywhere. Boy, they sure do. No doubt about it. I'm going to do, I'm going to set up this spray gun. I have a good test here. I, I want to put a coat of clear on that. This will be a good time to do it. Now, obviously the first thing, even if it's not in the directions, is totally run, you know, one thing of thinner right through the gun, because they usually put a little bit of oil in there to kind of clean it, keep it clean anyway. Let's see what the directions say. Oh, how convenient. They're in Japanese or Korean or something. Well... I don't even read English, let alone Korean. Any, not every English, I'm just kidding. All right, let's read the directions. And you can see, this is this is a pretty sophisticated uh, piece of equipment. So, before I go any further, I want to, and of course it troubleshoots, which is nice. Now, I've never used a gun like this. This is a the paint material. I can't even open the lid here, I'm so strong. Maybe that doesn't open. <laughs> it opens anyway what's nice about this I've seen people use these I've seen people that can tighten this up in one stroke at a pen too anyway this has the paint supply let me let me just explain this because there's no way I'm gonna get that on right now on camera what rather than a gravity feed where this sucks it up this this allows you to get a much finer spray because you're using the pressure of the material and it also allows you to use up the end of the material where in a, in a normal cup you always have a spoonful there you have to either throw away or put back in a box in the can. Another thing this allows you to do if I'm correct, if I'm reading the directions correctly, if you're going to spray down you can position it up. If you're going to spray this way you can, you can really have complete control of this and obviously it's just a jam nut if you were going to spray straight up. So for our purposes, we're going to spray relatively forward. Just tighten this by hand. It's got the same adjustments that we have normally on. This is the... This is one of the things you have a lot of control over. And rather than go into detail here, I'll just... If you buy one of these, read the directions carefully. You've got a lot more options than you have with a normal, you know, the hobby spray guns in terms of the pattern you can have. And I think if I'm if I'm reading the directions right, you should be able to spray at a lot lower pressure. But we're going to find out. Reading some of the directions, here's one of the things that's real handy. They send they give you a brush for cleaning. Now since we're going to be doing clear, and we're going to be checking, well, I'm, I'm going to basically do a little experiment here on some empty cans or something to see how I like, how I'm going to maximize the use of this. But now I normally, I'll be honest, I never clean guns. The, the guns keep the paint in them 24, because I use them every other day. I, they never sit on a shelf for six months. But in this case, I want to go by the direction, so at the end of the session, I will run thinner through the gun and clean it thing I found interesting in the directions it says the paint viscosity is too low now of course with the hobby guns that I use I never experience anything like this but because we're dealing with a precision thing now the difference is when you can atomize the paint a lot better you, in theory you can get a, a thinner better coat on just think of if you were going to cover your driveway and you were going to cover it with sand well you could cover it with a very little amount of sand if you were covering it with two inch rocks there'd be holes and gaps and you had to constantly fill it in so there's a possibility that we once we get this up and running and get it adjusted we're gonna have an ability to lay on a really nice thin coat which we don't have with the other equipment this is funny I'm looking at the other cup see there's a big cup and a little cup comes with it I'm thinking well here's a gain when you only have one cup in a case of this we're just gonna put a little bit of clear I can only put maybe two ounces in here don't I, I don't have to clean the big messy gun cup and by the way these don't thread off they pull out 
Only took me two hours to figure that out. <laughs> Very, this, I can just anticipate this is going to be real nice once I refine my system to using it. I'm going to run some thinner through here first. Again, you should run some thinner through. In the course of manufacturing, obviously, they can be, they put a little drop of oil or two in there, typically, in the gun body to keep any corrosion while this is in storage or before it's actually sold to the customer. And by the way, Bill told me the guy that sold this, the guy that imports them and sells them, he told me that as a tip, and I think that's a good one. The biggest of the guns, and this is the one I'm going to be doing the first part of this test with, and I have a good, a good little guinea pig here, this little tailpiece. So let me mix up some 50-50 clear. It's, it's on the relatively thick side because I want a dry coat. I know I don't want to go over paint edges with re a real wet coat. This is some nice piece of equipment, I, I can tell already. Now what's good about this is we have a decent day to do the test. I have just, just plain old thinner in here. And what I'm looking at is I can really control, I don't know if you can see this, how much material is coming out. This is, the knob is even marked, one, two, three, four, so if you wanted to make, I don't know, notations, if you're an artist, it's really, on three, it's really a killer. On two, it's fine. On one, almost nothing's kind of, well, it's just thinner anyway. Let's see what the fan pattern looks like here. Oh, so we get some material. Anyway, the directions cover exactly how to maximize this. But there's nothing better, well, we'll just run the rest of this thinner out. There's nothing better than just painting apart. See, I'm really not used to having nice stuff, so. <laughs> now I'm going to start with the, the fan adjustment relatively small. Now on the two setting, this is 50-50 on a two setting, you can see right away it's too dry. Let's see what three is like. Remember, I just want to dust on a coat here. I started at 25 pounds. I wonder what you look at. Let's see if you can see this. What a ver really fine coat this puts on. Much finer than I'm used to. I'm used to the, the guns I've been using. So let me try four. Now that's going to just blow it on. Now, at the setting of four is much more like what I'm used to for putting on a coat of clear. But each person, now see, that's a lot more like, if you've been watching videos, you know that's pretty much how I lay paint on. Again, I only want to get one coat on here because there's going to be ink work, letter sets, and this will protect the little touch-ups that we've done on this. And this is the bigger of the guns. There's a smaller gun. Well, my gut feeling here is that we're going to be having a ball with this gun. <laughs> this gun really can lay on a nice coat of paint. You know where a gun like this is handy too? For somebody who doesn't have a high skill level, they can make note of the adjustments, like three and two. They can make note of where these adjustments worked with you did the numbers that are in there. With a, or you could actually probably scratch those into another gun. But getting on one nice flat coat of clear like that, let this dry out in the garage for a while. Yeah, I think that's going to work. Anyway, Bill, we, uh, we appreciate your help with this. And if we have any questions, we'll give you a call. But this, for, for a lead-off batter hit, this looks pretty good. Now, I'm just trying on, on a bigger part like this. I don't know if we're going to be able to get much of this. Again, we're just trying to seal up all these paint lines. The color, the first coat of clear will give you an idea what this Miss Ashley Red is going to look like on the final plane also. The 
again, if any of my friends are thinking about investing in a real high-end, real nice precision spray outfit, this would be one I'd be looking at. I'd be giving Bill a call. Tell him to send you a pizza pie. Anyway, Bill, this really does look good. Not sure we're getting good video here because we're in an awkward spot. You know, while that's drying up, I can take a minute or so and pull the tape off of here. Get an idea if I need any touch-up. If I need touch-up, of course, ink is always a good way to do it. Always let the tape sit on 24 hours. Get that nice, clean line when you pull it back. This is this is a good trick that I use all the time. Is because I can't see through the lens cap. Is try to get any little overage on a tape. And if I scratch it, then I have to go back and put a little dot of white there. Oh, here it comes. Now any little, oops, there's a spot right there. Any little spot that doesn't come clean is a candidate for the thin ink pen. In fact, right here, give you an idea, right there, there's a little spot. We'll take care of that. Okay, the next step here is I want to carefully, and I have no sense videotape in it, I'm going to carefully peel this away, see how, how intricate of a pattern we can get out of our other little pattern, peel off the rubber cement, clean that up, touch it up with ink, that's really working out well. Maybe I'll get this finished today, in fact. Now I finished today with testing that big gun, and believe me, we'll be using it the rest of the plane because I want to get some experience with this. I feel like I can really make some gains with this high quality equipment. Anyway, I realize not everybody is, you know, is going to want this, but for the people that do, I think you really, this is really something special you can take advantage of come next Christmas time. Anyway, there's a small gun here. And, of course, the directions are in Japanese or something. Anyway, we're going to set this guy up. I have a little bit of time left today. And see, now, for instance, because I have to do the Miss Ashley lettering, this might be an appropriate gun for lettering. I'd always want to have the big gun for the clear, the biggest gun for the clear. This one, of course. I'll give this a little test today. I have a little time left. Believe me, try to do this when it's on camera. You're no, not going to happen. Anyway, that's what gives us credibility. We never edit video. I'm going to assume, since the directions, I haven't read them yet, that this is my adjustment or one of them. Okay, well, first we're going to read the directions. They're doing this 40 times to practice. We finally have it down pat. Try doing it looking through a lens. Anyway, clean the gun with thinner as per Bill's instruction. I, and obviously the reason is I'm going to use this big gun for putting the rest of the clear on a plane. From this point on I'll use this equipment just so I can get familiar with it. And this looks like just such good stuff now. I'm sure the nicest thing is having these knobs that they're all preset. Once I can get a set for this this should be good like when Mike Kajeski's here and he doesn't he's not real familiar with setting it. I can just say in this case, we'll be using two and four. Go, go spray. 
anyway, excellent. I want to set up the smaller gun because we're going to do the lettering, one of the next projects, the Miss Ashley lettering. And I'll do the lettering with the little gun and the clear with the big gun. This is really some nice stuff. And some thinner through the little gun just to make a, a case of some. Well, still some in there. I don't want to dump it. One of, the, one of the things that I like about this particular gun, and this is an RG2, this is really, really light on the touch, light on the feel. It's got a very, very fine adjustment for the spray pattern, very fine adjustment for the volume of the material. Now, we don't have anything masked off ready to paint yet, and I don't want to, I don't just want to go out and paint garbage cans or something, but as soon as we get to do the lettering, this is going to be the gun we're going to try to use. Bill also sent a whole lot of literature, and there's all kinds, I mean, every possible thing, quick disconnects, lightweight air hoses, and he sent me an airbrush, too. But this is one of the things in the next couple of weeks, I guess, I can, look at even have little compressors, and there's just so many things. See, this is an area that I'm not real familiar with, because this is really, in essence, what this is, this is really commercial stuff, with people that really know their stuff. I don't count myself as one of them, but all the little bottles for the airbrushes and boy, there's a million things you could do. And I have an airbrush. Now, I don't have any, to tell you the truth, I'm right now I don't have anything. I probably could have used it for doing the trim, and obviously I'll give it a, a, ch uh, a fair shot, but I don't have anything right now to put in here. In fact, I can't even get it out of the box. See, this is nice to have. Okay, the instruction, I can read up on the instruction manual. What's nice, when you have some new equipment, it's a good idea not to run out and, you know, and paint your paint your wife or something. Now, what's good? Actually, Kajeski's plane is almost ready to paint. As soon as somebody's over here that has a, let's call it a guinea pig, even though that's not the right word. This, by the way, is real nice because it allows you to control a lot better than well than anything else that I know of. Anyway, we'll be checking this. Mike should be here one day this week to paint his plane and we'll... Now see what's good about letting Mike test it too is Mike is a relative newcomer to the world of spraying. He had, up until last year he had never sprayed anything. So we'll see if we can just hand him the gun and say set it on two and four and go spray. Anyway, and what we're gonna try to do, and I don't know that we'll have time to do it right this minute, by the way, he sent an extra tip for the gun. I guess this is not a tip. This is to connect the air hose. And there's extra little parts for everything here, an extra little connector. But what's nice with something, if and, and again, if you choose to do it, one of the things an airbrush would really allow you to do is color fades like this much better than with the equipment I have. They're very crude. So if we were doing kind of a, a real exotic paint job like a Midgley job or something like uh, Bob Brookins. Bob Brookins would just love, th this would just be up his alley. But it doesn't mean, even if you're at my level, which is relatively low on a food chain, and you've basically been using old-fashioned stuff, this is, this is one thing I'm real excited about, and as this plane finishes, and as we... Now, it's that magic time of year. Every year this time, I sit down with all of these thousands of things here, that I wanted to. These are all things that John and Elliot have both gave, given me different graphic shapes and sizes and courtlids and I need to go through these and I want to come up with. The only thing I don't have is the lettering. I haven't got any lettering templates that match. So Some of these were taken I guess from write off pictures they're done with computers so I don't really know I'm not that computer savvy but some of these are different some have shading so I have plenty of things to choose from here I want to try to lay out and at least get laid out the lettering I always keep my letter sets in a box and you can see I've got special letter sets for every possible project here pro marks some things that Frank McMillan has given me but anyway what I do generally is I try to take a day like today, sit around and spend the whole day, just basically spend the whole day, so at the end of this session I know exactly what I want to do and I have the templates made 
for the lettering. And it really is a very time-consuming part of the job. Real happy the way these little shields, horses, worked out. And it gives us a little variation from having checkerboards. But here's one of the problems is, see, when I laid out this lettering, I, I did this basically by hand, and that's, that's all gold leaf. But then coming up with the letters that look similar, it's, you know, there is no script for those letters. You, you just have to kind of figure it out on your own. So it may be that part of this job is going to be I'm going to have to refigure this out. Or if I wimp out, I can basically use some variation of those original letters. One of the most important things, before I go any further, is I need to decide, I got these, these rough computer-generated things in various sizes and I want to figure out just how large now if that lettering is too small if it's too dominant it doesn't look right so I want to lay this out and I want to lay it out I'm going to lay the flaps in place too just to get a ballpark feel for how big the graphics should be the lettering and how big the numbers and I have no numbers I'm going to have to sketch them out by hand see what happens is you have all these millions of fonts but the letters and the numbers to me anyway they don't exactly match they aren't thinking of model aviation when they do these things. Here, too, the rule has changed that because we intend to possibly fly this plane in F2B, instead of seeing the old thing, you had an N number, you needed the N that designated the country, now it's USA. So we need to lay out three more letters. A couple of things that are significant is I always want to lay this out and look at it with the flaps kind of just laying in place so I see roughly what I have. And I want that that there's a look that you have in your mind the way that's going to swirl on it and and if it were I'm just trying to picture it, or too far out to one end it wouldn't look right too high too low too large or too small it's kind of a it's the kind of thing you just have to go back and forth back and forth back and forth until until it looks like what you have in your mind now here's an area where take apart planes are handy as can be we don't have to deal with the fuselage and one of the other things I always do with any kind of any kind of paint or graphics do the bottom first so if we decide after doing a whole lettering that we like the tail on the Y larger or we like something different we can change the template and put the nice one on the top I like the way these little horses came out by the way I want to go through some of the steps of how I evolved this <coughs> Again, we have several different choices of the swirls and the lettering. I wanted to keep the original letters, but I wanted to thicken them. So what I did is I blacked out and then traced over with the outside edge instead of the inside edge. And what that did, that thickened up the letters themselves. Now the next step after that was I wanted to make a tracing I made a few other small changes. I changed the way the M came down. Made a few other changes. Again, this is the artistic part of it. I don't know that we should even put this on video. I I changed the way the two came off of the Miss Ashley. And the point that I'm making is you start with something, but it evolves. In this case, the Ashley part evolved into this. Now, all, uh, all of these little inside cutouts, I'm not really going to need. So what I did is I made a, just as a rough, this is the shape of the piece of plywood that I'll need. And you can see how this is evolving. But this is the easy part. This is the part, basically, uh, you know, less than an hour. I don't know if you can see, but I've spent uh, quite a bit of time on this part of it trying to make lettering that looks similar and again because I'm not a sign painter I'm not I'm not involved in this on a daily basis so but I wanted to copy the thicker the thicker I made the letters the nicer I liked them and so what I did I took this piece now to see if I was going to like this when it was painted I wanted to lay it out in what amounted to be a color just to get an idea now, from this, I need to make letters. And the letters are the most complex of all because they not only have to match the USA. I think you can see how I, I've, I've kind of made them as similar in 
and gone back and forth many times and done this but now I want to cut these out and get a look as to if they look first off I want them to be balanced so that the Miss Ashley and the lettering has a kind of a balanced look if it doesn't I'll make the smaller of the two bigger or the bigger of the two smaller you know I'm trying to get the length similar but if I want to I can just space this a little bit further apart and in the case of this when I actually make the pattern I'm going to allow I can make this a little closer together so we have the same length roughly the same height and kind of that same swirly look this this part of it is very time consuming for me again because I don't do this a lot and to tell you the truth I'll probably change it 14 times by the time I actually get it uh, to where I'm cutting plywood now once I get this final and I'm real happy with it I'm gonna save the original and make a tracing on and can be anything it can be mylar it can be office paper anything so that 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 part can get glued with contact cement right to some 16th plywood that and once I'm totally satisfied that everything is the way I like it now I haggled around with this long enough did some trimming did some shortening some squeezing some stretching and the next step is I want to get out the plywood and some contact cement and glue these right to some 16th plywood now the reason I want to make out plywood letters is then I use the plywood letters to make a mask that ensures that I'll have the exact same letter as I have in a mask and that allows me to ink around the whole letter that worked out so well on Strega that for the amount of time it takes to do the plywood it's it's minimal it's in less than an hour but what happens is then anytime I want to use these same templates even on a set of plans I can make an exact rendition of them also what it allows me to do is similar to Strega let's look at this and this is something I like is you can three-dimensionalize things by just sliding that plywood down and you get that real nice very accurate shadow so let me get out the contact cement let me get out so I hope we have some plywood here and uh, and the latest puppy out because I don't want to waste any plywood and by the way what I think I'm gonna to try to do I haven't done this yet I'm gonna to try to do this on 64th plywood instead of 16th now if it doesn't work I'll just laminate two layers of it but I wanted to give that a shot no special reason I just think it'll be easier to get a nice edge on that 64th plywood seems to make an edge nicer we'll find out but but first off to cut each piece and just the outline I don't need to know where these little slivers are going to be in the final product because this is going to have a shadow and as we bring this down these will all become solid black anyway and we can just do that with ink which is another nice little feature of uh, using this type of lettering and see some of the things I've adjusted is I've, I've from looking at it at a lot of different angles it was starting to get too big because I did this all freehand of course you, not that you could ever tell so what I tried to do is I'm going to try to lay out some some guidelines on the final mask and I know I want to trim some of these down and if any of them get too big I can just shave the tops of them down again it's a lot of give and take a lot of that I don't even know that they that you can do this with a computer it just kind of a freehand thing not one of the things that was really annoying was I couldn't get this to look right it when I would put a big curve in it mm, and when I'd make it all block razor straight so I've kind of come out in between try to try to fudge an in-between size sometimes just one little detail like this see not having this equal because I didn't do it with a with a rule but I wanted to have some curve in here and but and it doesn't look right when it's perfectly straight but it doesn't look right when it's got a real big curve like a piece of spaghetti either so what I'm trying to do is I'll cut this oversize when I cut it and obviously if you had a set of French curves you could uh, you could do this mechanically but I think just doing free and sometimes just doing it freehand it looks good enough and one te technique that seems to work for me is when I'm not sure of what I want I always make it oversize I just find that in this case or in a case similar to this it's always easier to just trim and trim and trim shave and shave and shave than it is to try to stretch something once like like 
do Mr. Pillsbury Doughboy, it's, it's easier to shave it than to do this, than to stretch it longer. thing in laying this out is I'm, I'm looking for areas where it just doesn't look right. And this is one of them. It doesn't look like a one here, and I'm just over-sketching it. Because when I do the cutting, I'll cut that. And then I want to get, in, in the case of, of something similar to this, where I want a straight line, well, what's, what's one of the techniques that'll work? Again, this is, I guess, like anything else, it's a, just a lot of give and take until you're happy with it. I wasn't happy with the point on this 7. That just didn't look like it belonged there either. One of the things I always like to, when I blacken it and I can kind of get a feel for it, one of the things I've never liked is when you look at the lettering on a stun chip and you can tell it came off a letter set pack or a typeface that the 70 other planes that in in the Nats have that unique lettering the uniqueness of it is this is something that's very time consuming but I think in the final product having a having a layout of lettering that is not exactly the same as six or seven other people there where they just have that same font it's one of the things I think is a good investment in time and energy just to show you what's available and I I've used this to good advantage. John Pothier kind of laid it out in in very long script, then took exactly the same script and with a computer shrunk it this way, then took and shrunk it more. I think he did the opposite. I think he did he started with this from a photo, one of the photos we have of the real Miss Ashley, and then stretched it. But you can see even subtle changes make the whole lettering look totally different. And this is the point. This is why it just takes time for me. Obviously, if you're a professional artist, this would go in a matter of minutes, but I just need to sit and look at it over and over again to, to make myself convinced that I'm happy with it. I use on a project like this, I always make myself Xerox copies of it, and these are for Elliot, for when he does the plan, so that everything in the final product, even, even the lettering we have for Strega, we have on plywood, and to save everything in kind of a, uh, a graphics bag, and especially if you ever need, it's extremely handy to have, if you ever need to do a repair. Again, one copy of everything we have for all the graphics that will be on this plane. Let's hope we never need it. We're going to do a little test here of the 64th plywood. One side is relatively smooth. There's always a smooth side, always a rough side. You can even hear it. You can feel it. But what I'm going to do, I'll take this outside because I don't want to, I don't want to stink up the house. Take my spray contact cement, spray the whole sheet, and then I can lay out my letters in various spots. Funny, I purchased the Canada's cement. This is number 90. We like 77 for doing foam wings and things. But I really carefully mark the can that it melts foam. But for a use like this, this is going to be fine. Spray contact cement seems to work the best on this. You gotta kind of just press it down nice and smooth and make sure this dries to the touch. Give it five or ten minutes before we start cutting out the letters. And I can kind of lay this out, I guess, in such a way that I don't waste a lot of plywood. That's what's great about growing up poor. You learn to never waste, you never even waste a cup of coffee. something right away and the first time I try to cut the 64th plywood with big scissors the little tiny scissors with small points just seem to be able to get into the curves and corners better again I'm not sure since in the past we've used thicker plywood but it isn't a real time-consuming thing to cut these out and then you need once it's once that once they're all cut out you need to dress every edge off with some real like 600 sandpaper the smoother you can get the edges, of course, the better. And it's nice whenever you have, like, like for instance, here's two parallel lines right here. I can make the cut so that they're all right in good alignment. 
Now the trouble is with doing this, and I've learned this in the past, you always want to look at the back. It's the back. To see, like right there, there's a little point. Well, we're going to dress this off with some fine sandpaper later anyway. But that's, I want to try to leave the line on if possible. Again, what I'm trying to do is make these letters thicker and thicker and thicker. Now, of course, if you're building a Miss Ashley or a Voodoo or something, and somebody can, you can generate these masks, they're real nice, but I think some of that is, I just like doing it this way. Just an old-fashioned brick-and-mortar guy, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, you get the feeling we're just going to cut this whole thing out, and this will be our pattern for making the mask and for doing the ink work on the final lettering. In these curved scissors that Larry Cunningham graciously sent us, I've figured out right away that these will be real handy. They're curved. These really come in handy for some of the curves that are in this lettering pattern. Again, having a couple different scissors is just... The little pointy ones seem to do well at getting in corners. These seem to go around corners this way real nice. All of these are cut out. The next thing, and this is a, I guess a time, but I'll put my glasses on. A kind of time-consuming step is, you need to look at the back, and you need to see, see this edge here is not smooth enough because we're going to run an ink pen on this eventually. So I want to dress off these edges. By the way, it looks like the 64th plywood will be fine. And in these curved areas, I guess I can get out my little sanding tools here. But it, it, there's nothing exotic about this, nothing high tech. Just want to dress that edge off. And once I get these all dressed off and cleaned up, the next step will be to make my masks up. And once you run your finger on that, it's nice and smooth. Dress both edges off. The thing that's handy is to get in the corners while you're working on this. A brand new blade will allow you to get, since the scissors don't really make nice clean cuts, but anywhere, see, this is a really rough one here. But the little time that you spend doing this, and I'm guessing the whole thing will be less than an hour, the time you spend, you've got a permanent ability to reproduce these letters and the ink lines around them. Next thing I want to do, and this is, I'm going to use the bottom of the plane to lay this out. Always work off the bottom first, needless to say. I want to lay out, since I have these now in full scale, and get some reference exactly where I want to, well, see I can move them forward, back, side, spread them out, but I need to get some reference lines so when I make up the mask I can use the trailing edge of the wing for the, the mask. question of, since I have it all laid out, I want to basically get a look at it in full size. This can get moved over this way, this can get moved over, this can get moved over. Now I'd like to get a, establish a center line here for ending one rib from the end, ending one rib from the end, we need to move this over this way. Trying to trying to make it as symmetrical as possible. So now I know if I'm measuring off the center here, I'm at six and a half. Three and a quarter would be the center of the letters. So I can really get a rough idea. Three inches up. 
Now when I lay out the mask, I'll just get a center line and then I can lay these out to so make sure they're not like this. Make sure there is in some kind of relative alignment anyway. After a lot of fudging around and moving it back and forth, it looks like I've got it close to where I want it. But now I want to get for sure my center line to the hinge line and then I can lay out in on a piece of, uh, well, probably need two pieces of paper of ordinary copying paper and then I can cut the mask using this as a pattern. Working right off the pattern, what I did, I established that I want to have the bottom of this two and a half inches from the hinge line, the lowest point of that lettering, and I need to do this in two pieces, of course. Now, what this does, this allows me to do a test, because any rough spot on the plywood is going to show up in the final lining. And, of course, when I go to cut this out, I've got two pieces of paper taped back to back. I'm going to see if it's possible if I can cut both of the patterns at exactly the same time as a way of making them perfectly symmetrical and as a way of saving some time. Oops, just let it move. Now, obviously, we're not dealing in pencil lines here. Now, I'll have to true that up by hand. But where these plywood pieces come in and they're totally invaluable when you go to do the inking and the shadowing. And I remember doing Strega. What I did, I took took my master tape for the lettering out of the video library and just ran it by again to see if I'd remember anything. And you always, there's always a few things you remember. That's why it's good to have a video library. Any little tip you can have that saves you time and energy. Things I find real helpful, always use a brand new blade, is when I'm cutting a curve, I'm just trying to show this in a close-up, and I go around a curve, you notice I'm, I'm twisting the knife in my hand. Now they make, and Bob Martens had given me one at one time, and I'm sure it's out on loan somewhere where it's it's as happy as can be and being fed well. There was a knife that had a little swirly blade that was made just for this, but certainly we can get through get through a job this small with just what we have in-house. But if you visit an art supply store, you'll find out there's, there's some real nice little... They're very fine, in fact. They're, they're about a tenth this width. And they're made just for doing this kind of cutout. But this is just an ordinary XL hobby blade. The key here is because we're going through two pieces of paper, we want to get a brand new blade. And I know people that think, oh, yeah, that blade is still sharp. Uh uh. Now, right here is where I'm twisting my hand as I go around. Again, it's, it's that twist in motion as you're cutting to make the twist. There's always going to be little bridges where I haven't scored it through. Looks like we got one up here. But we have made, and they are exact, well, I wouldn't say exactly, but they're relatively the same now. Now I can just look at one of the masks, and of course we have two the same. I can make sure I have it positioned where I want. Let's see that that carries the line down. Now I want to carry the same line down on the bottom of this here and maybe the middle of the Y when I make the second mask. A lot of this is redundant. Well, let's see if we get that piece on. See what I don't want to have is 
Now I can move the whole piece up or down, pick up some reference points here. And since I'm trying to stretch this side, I can leave a little more of a gap than I really need, and I can just fill that in with tape. Let me just, whoops. Because I'm looking at the overview here. The overview is what I'm real concerned with. And because a lot of this is redundant, we'll just fast forward through this, but I'm gonna cut all the patterns out the same way off a reference line, and then we'll be ready to start the masking. Now before I put on the Reba cement on the wing, I want to look down and I want to see a complete... Well, the look I'm looking for is that it's a, it's a straight line. I don't want one to be crooked or one the other way around. I like to have them as straight as possible. And I'll do one panel at a time because the trick is get the rubber cement on, put the pad on, mask it off, and run out and spray it. Then I'll come in, do the other one. I don't, I don't want to sit and let the, let the stencil sit on there for two or three hours before I go and spray it. Now it's funny, it looks like we're at the end of the rubber cement here. <laughs> Maybe we are. it with the tin foil. As is always the case, I want to get all the extra rubber cement off. Just rolling it up into a little ball. This needs to dry a little bit more, but it, it basically comes right off. I'll clean that and I'll be ready to spray the gold. Now I'm going to try to use the little gun, the smaller of the two. It's an RG2. I want to make sure all my little ends, even though these are not None of this is real critical because we're going to outline it. Now this gun seems to be a lot, a lot finer of a spray anyway. At least what I've got here. Notice how little overspray you can control the overspray way down. Something that's hard to do with a bigger gun. Now I always like to make sure I get the coat on good and wet so I get good penetration. I don't want to leave it dry. You can see how little overspray there is with this. One of the little benefits. Now it's a, it's a cloudy, clammy day, but you can get some idea of what that's going to look like when it's done. Now what I'll do while that's drying, I'll lay out the other panel. 
new to using this spray equipment. Let me, I noticed one thing. You know how you have to shake a regular gun over and over because all the pigment thing sinks to the bottom? You don't really have to shake this as much because it sucks the paint off the bottom. So that, obviously you don't want to be spraying straight pigment, but... Now I see here's, here's a problem. See the mask is coming up here? But I can just pat it back down. But now that I know I have a problem there, just to avoid making it any worse, I must have stuck my finger in there, or there's not enough cement. I can spray it this way. And that'll help pat it down rather than pick it up. Now we're hoping to have out at the Brodak contest a little spray seminar. Maybe we can get some of this equipment out there and do a little hands-on, so like for beginners, maybe some people that haven't really had access to this quality of equipment can check it out, give it a try, see if it's going to fit their needs. Believe me, it fits my needs just fine. Okay. Obviously the next step, this has to dry and then we'll just repeat the whole thing on the other side. Stretch on this lettering now at last. Now I got one little tail on this that doesn't want to... So I'll try to hit it from this angle. On the bottom edge, it doesn't even matter because we're going to put the shading in. That edge will be recut. Of course.